Okay, so I'll hand you over to Brona Hayden, who is uh, from Biogen Ireland, and she's Medical Lead and Associate Medical Director at Biogen Ireland. Thank you, Carol. Hi, good morning to everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you to Carol for inviting me to come and speak with you this morning. And thank you to all of you who joined the call. Um, we obviously had imagined we'd be in a room um, um, together when we were initially talking about this meeting, but um, I hope this platform works for everyone. And as I said to Carol earlier, I'm happy to answer questions during the, the presentation afterwards um, uh, uh, and subsequently if anyone has um, additional questions. Um, just to say, you know, this pr presentation or this topic um, about the, the move, moving from academia into industry are my own thoughts. So I have worked with a number of companies. I, I currently am working with Biogen, but um, I suppose this is my own experience of moving from the world of academia into uh, you know, a commercial um, business environment. Uh, so the, um, uh, uh, we all, all of the companies that I've worked with are um, members of EFA, the Irish Pharmaceutical Health Care Association, and we adhere to the EFA code. But you know, my, my commentary today is really my own, um, based on my own uh, personal experiences. Um, so I was sure from a very early age that I wanted to study science and I wanted to work in research. I was really, really clear about that. And um, after, sorry, I'm just trying to move. Yeah, there we go. After my, um, oops, Daisy. After my, I hope everybody can see that okay. So after my degree in biochemistry, which, um, is from UCD, the Department of Biochemistry in UCD. I started a PhD also in the Department of um, Biochemistry, and my PhD was in protein chemistry and enzyme kinetics. And I know for sure that the completion, you know, the studying for a PhD and the completion of my PhD really um, laid the foundation for my entire career to date. And I don't believe that I would have had the same opportunities or the same career path if it weren't for my PhD. I think the skills that I developed um, and expanded during that time um, working in research and studying um, topics that I did are really skills that I rely on every day um, in my current job and in, in, in all the roles that I've had to date. So for me, it was the right choice. Um, and on top of that, I loved it. You know, I, I personally loved working in research. I loved working at the bench. Um, we worked with a great group of people. So much fun um, and great opportunities, which you know are you know I hope are still there for 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 PhD students to work and collaborate with groups in other countries. I was very fortunate that our particular group had um partners in a number of countries including japan and i had an opportunity to travel there during my studies um, to meet with the groups there and present our data and exchange ideas so it was, you know there was lots of great examples and opportunities that came my way um, and i look back very fondly there was also then the opportunity to teach um, younger students and develop those skills um, expand and develop writing skills um, and um, you know all of that together uh, it's a very valuable uh, resource um, and experience to have regardless of, of sort of where you're, you're, you lay your hat. Um, after my PhD I you know really continued on that trajectory of, 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 of research um, and I moved the whole way to Trinity College Dublin to the Moyne Institute which is the Department of Microbiology um, for my postdoctorate fellowship and at the time the particular group I went to work with uh, working on Staphylococcus aureus and they were they needed a protein chemist um, which I was and I wanted to develop and expand my skill set in terms of my, my, my research skill set and so it was a perfect marriage really um, great group of people and uh, and really, really interesting work at a time when, you know, research in molecular biology was really expanding. 
and I should say this is back at the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the noughties, so it's, it's some time ago. And um, after a period of time, an opportunity uh, arose back in my old department in the Department of Biochemistry in UCD for a lecture. And so before I knew it, I found myself back in UCD teaching, continuing research. And I also got involved in a number of different programs and committees within the faculty. So it was a real opportunity to um, continue in an environment that I wanted to be in, that I enjoyed doing what I wanted to do, but also getting a real understanding of the mechanics of, of the university and really how things worked. Because when you're a student, you just see it from one, um, one uh, direction, but it was, gave me a whole new um, focus and uh, vision. And when I look back, there was no one trigger or there was no one moment or there was no incident where I said, that's it, I'm going to, you know, I'm ready now to move. Um, I think it was always going to be the, the next step or the natural step for me to, to, to move into industry. Um, again, I, I, when I look back, I, I know that I was, I was mobilizing myself and that I, I completed a business course. And there was a number of things that, that I did around that time um, where I was, I was getting ready um, to make the move. Um, but it was a very, very different time. So this is now 2000 and 2005, and it's incredible. And, and Carol and I just spoke in the last half hour about the, the difference, um, the, the, the environment and just everything from technology or how we worked um, and how um, industry and academia were perceived by the various parties was, was, was totally different. So the first thing from my perspective was that I didn't know anyone in the pharmaceutical industry. So all my peers were either still working in academia, they were postdocing, some had gone abroad to the States, to Australia. Um, the, the, the people that I worked with, they were all, you know, at that time anyway, um, staying where they were. Um, I'd obviously friends outside of science, but I, I, I didn't have any friends or colleagues who were in any of the pharmaceutical companies within Ireland. And if you can imagine there was, there was, there was no social media, so there was no mechanism to network. You knew now it's totally different. So we all have computers and our, uh, our phones and our watches. We've access to, to, to all these platforms, but this is a world where there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no Twitter, LinkedIn, none of these platforms. We, d we hadn't even imagined them. I remember back when I was in UCD, the, the toolbar that we used, the search engine, I should say, was Yahoo. Um, that's what, that was the default. Um, some of you won't even have heard of, of Yahoo. I mean, it's difficult now because I can't see the, the, the audience, but I'm going to make a, an educated guess that in 2004 and 2005, um, many of you were very young then, so you've grown up with all of these platforms and, um, and the ability to network seamlessly. We can contact people, we can find people. Um, I mean, how many, certainly in my, for my generation, so many of us have um, we connected with friends that we knew 20 years ago through LinkedIn. Um, so, but for those of you that have grown up with all of these platforms, it's, it's totally different. So that was the first thing that was just, it was, it was just a real puzzle. How, you know, how, 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 how to connect with or, or how to find out more about the environment and the, and the pharmaceutical industry and, 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 um, and to see if that move was going to be possible. That was the first thing. The second thing was that there was certainly at the time um, among some um, parts of academia and some people there was a, a hesitancy about uh, industry and I, and I know when I spoke with my own professor at the time who um, was you know just when I when I talked to him about about moving and, and uh, you know looking to move into the industry you know, he, he was clearly disappointed, clearly um, uh, surprised. And his, his comment was, um, if you leave, I don't know if it'll be, if you can come back, I don't know how you, you could come back. So that was the, and, and that mindset was, was quite prevalent at the time among um, a certain cohort within academia. It was this almost nervousness. And then there was the concern that the industry would wonder well, what 
does someone who's never worked in industry before have to offer? They only worked within an academic environment and do they have anything to offer? So there was, uh, you know, I, I think that's, it's totally different now, but that was certainly the mindset for some people, not for everyone, but for some people at the time. So there was, um, for me, it was trying to ensure that I could make the, the, the move. And then I suppose the final part of it was, um, were my skills transferable? Pardon me, I'm just moving the, the camera there so that people can see the screen. Um, were the skills that I had developed um, during my studies and also my, my, my working life within academia, were they transferable? And actually, what, what, what were my skills or what are my skills? I think for anyone working in, in, in research and who has completed um, a, a PhD in, in science, obviously we have the, the analytical, the technical, the scientific experience, the ability to generate, generate data, interpret data, which is critical, both in academia and in industry problem solving, which you do every day of the week when you're studying for a PhD because it never goes the way you think it's going to go and it'll go a different way and you need to follow, we follow the science and that's, and that's it because the answers are there, aren't they? And you, 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 you've got to really be so flexible and so adaptable. And I think that's, that's the thing, you know, there was a perception that maybe, um, and this is again going back to that time, that academics were, you know, um, very set in their ways, but actually we are incredibly um, adaptable because we have to be, because in science, you just never know what the data is going to show you. And then I put down curiosity, um, and I, I don't even know if this, if, if, if everyone would consider this a skill, but for me, it's something that has certainly um, helped me along my um, career, both in, in, uh, in academia and also in industry, being curious, um, about new things and not being worried about needing to go a step back, but actually being curious to, to, to move, not always forward, but just to something new. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that's really helped me along the way. Um, just to say in terms of my own um, jump from one environment to the other, it actually was via the very traditional route of a, of a recruiter. Um, because really that was, which is still uh, an incredibly important aspect of um, you know, moving within roles within any industry um, nowadays, but in the absence of having all of the other um, opportunities or options. Um, and my first role was in a company called um, GlaxoSmithKline, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but I just wanted to first of all mention some of the roles within the pharmaceutical industry. So just to say that at the time as well, there was very little R&D um, um, from an industry perspective within Ireland. There is some now, but certainly 15 years ago, while there was a lot of manufacturing, there was very little R&D. Um, uh, so that wasn't an option. And then within the pharmaceutical industry, there was a plethora of different roles. But I'm not even sure at the time that I fully understood the scope of all the roles or the fact that you know within companies um, you can people move within roles um, and, and, and do so quite freely and, and there are great opportunities within many companies and great examples of where people have gone into started in one particular role and actually moved into other roles um, but within medical affairs which is where I've worked for the past almost 15 years um, you'll come across anyone who has you know, had a look at different companies or uh, opportunities with companies or has been looking on LinkedIn at, at, at particular roles that might become, become available. You'll be familiar with, with some of these terms. So medical director, medical advisor, medical manager, medical information, and then also drug safety or pharmacovigilance. Um, and certainly within all of these roles, there are a mix of medics, pharmacists, and PhD graduates. Um, there are opportunities within regulation, regulatory affairs, clinical trials, um, and then there's also commercial roles, business unit roles, which differ from, from your traditional commercial roles, marketing and, and market access. So as I mentioned earlier, for me, moving into the industry, I didn't know anyone um, in any of these roles, but actually when I joined GlaxoSmithKline, there was probably within the medical function, there was probably eight or nine um, PhD graduates and pharm pharmacists working 
within its medical function. Um, now, um, so many of my, my, my former peers and friends from academia are in the industry in a mix of roles, um, many in medical affairs roles, but many have moved into commercial roles, business roles, marketing, and market access, which is around the process of reimbursement. So you, some of you will be familiar with the, the, the HCA process that's required to um, understand and, 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 and determine if the product is, uh, the drug is, is cost effective. Um, and it's really about ensuring that a medicine um, gets access to, or patients get access to a medicine. So there are a mix of roles and there are a mix of opportunities within the industry and people do um, and have done and can um, move within different uh, roles, depending on the skill set, obviously, and, and, and depending on, on the company. Uh, just to say as well that there are two um, uh, colleagues in other companies who are former um, PhD graduates from UCD who are now general managers um, within pharmaceutical companies. So um, graduates are not restricted to medical roles. However, um, typically and, and often, that is the, the, the obvious route in, into the industry, but not the only one. My own um, career to date has spanned three companies. So my first uh, opportunity was with GlaxoSmithKline, which is a British um, large pharmaceutical company with medicines across many different therapy areas. And at the time, I suppose there was a couple of, of things and it is, you know, timing is, is so much in life, isn't it? Um, I was looking to move. GSK had an opportunity and it was also one of the first companies within Ireland who um, had started to employ uh, PhD graduates, medics and pharmacists. So they were really probably ahead of the curve. Now that's totally changed now. So every single pharmaceutical company in Ireland will have a mix of of, of, of those graduates within their medical function and other departments. But at the time, GSK was really leading the way. Um, and so for me, it was a, you know, the right time, the right place, great opportunity to work with great people and to really get a good understanding in a large company of how the pharmaceutical industry in Ireland works. Um, great training ground, really. Um, I then moved to a French vaccine company, Sanofi Pasteur MSD. Um, headquarters were in Lyon in, in, in France. I was working in, in the Dublin office and I was brought in to head up the medical affairs um, department and I suddenly found myself working in vaccines, which is still comes under the, the you know, pharmaceutical, um, pharmaceuticals and, and, and the pharmaceutical industry. And we were still members of EFA, which I mentioned earlier, the IPHA. Um, but it's totally different working in vaccines to pharmaceuticals because, you know, in public health medicine, it's a fascinating area to work in and, and um, very, very interesting. Now, suddenly you're working with the Department of Health and the HSE, the immunization office within the HSE. And the main customer really is, is, is the Department of Health for the introduction and the uh, maintenance of national vaccination programs so very different model um, different type of science um, different medicine preventative medicine um, and, uh, and and you know great it was great learning for me to work there and I worked there for eight years um, and I think probably the highlight of my own professional career to date certainly one of them was working on the HPV vaccine for uh, Sanofi Pasteur MSD and the implementation of the vaccination program in Ireland back in 2010 and then the evolution of that program so that was definitely a, a highlight for me and then more recently uh, been over four years ago but certainly my most uh, my current um, role is with uh, a neurology company um, a biotech company American Swiss our headquarters are in Cambridge in Massachusetts and uh, regional offices in, in Switzerland um, and it's a neurology company with a very strong heritage in MS and a very very rich pipeline um, it's a very interesting exciting company and I think a very brave company um, with you know really science uh, strong science and, and, and um, 
and uh, some very interesting, uh, uh, they, the company has made some very interesting choices. So within Biogen, um, I joined to, again, establish a medical uh, department within Ireland. Prior to joining, um, the medical affairs function was managed with the team in the UK, um, but the company felt the time was right to expand in Ireland. And so I have um, joined now for over four years and set up a team and um, and the company is, you know, uh, as with all companies, evolving and changing and, and adapting. And, and, you know, this is a perfect example of, 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 of us all adapting in light of the current environment. I'm used to being in an office and, and this is my 12th week working from home. And while we have the technology, it's obviously a very different environment the being working from home through the, the lens of the, the computer as opposed to being in, in the office with, with colleagues. Um, but I think people are are really ad adapting and showing how we're all capable of looking at new ways of of, of doing things. So the, the 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 main point I wanted to make about the, the companies that I've 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 worked with and, and currently working with is that you know one was is a very large broad pharmaceutical company, a British company. Um, the second, a French vaccine company, a European company, but with the uh, you know headquarters in France. And I now work for um, an American biotech company, neurology. Um, so very, very different, but um, requiring the, the, the same skill set. So if I look back to, and I know I mentioned earlier, the, the skills that I, I developed during my, my academic career, my PhD, and subsequently, they are the skills that I rely on every single day. So while my roles within three companies were very, very um, different, um, all medical affairs, all similar titles. Um, the actual work um, has been very varied and very, very diverse, but I still rely on the, on the skill set that I developed during my um, education and during my training within the academic environment. And, um, and I think curiosity uh, is still, it's still important for me to have that on the slide because it's still um, uh, very important uh, on an ongoing basis to ensure um, that we keep keep things interesting um, and, and keep progressing. Um, and the final point I just wanted to make uh, and it's to the to the group is that you know there, there was an old-fashioned thinking, and, and and those of you, I suppose, this current generation um, doesn't is not a, uh, probably doesn't feel. Um, it as strongly as we would have back 15 um, post years ago, but the, the notion um, that um, academic skills are not transferable to the um, pharmaceutical industry or in fact to any industry is nonsense. I think the, the skills that you require, that we all um, acquire during a research career are immensely valuable um, and you know extremely important for an interesting leadership career in pharma um, and also equally in, in other industries and other environments. So I'm going to pause now and uh, hand back to Carol and uh, happy to answer any questions that there may be from the, the group. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Brola. Uh, that was really interesting and I think a very hopeful message as well that, as you say, the skills that people are developing, um, you know, throughout a PhD and, and postdoc research are, are really transferable to industry. So, because you do hear different, you know, the, the old fashioned views, you say you still do sometimes hear that being uh, touted. So I think really nice to hear from, from the horse's mouth as such, someone who has made that move and very successfully obviously into industry. Um, so we have a few questions coming in. Great. Um, so uh, there's one on, can you give an update on aducanumab? So it's, it's probably an obvious question given um, given that you're uh, working in Biogen, but I, I don't know, obviously, how much you can say about that, so. No, I, I, I well, well I, I mean, unfortunately I can't at the moment because I'm not permitted to discuss anything that's not licensed within Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I mean, unfortunately, I, I can't. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's fair enough. Um, there's another question um, about the. Can you address uh, biological pathways beyond the amyloid beta hypothesis for drug development? So, 
sorry, just... Will I, will I read that out again? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, can you address biological pathways beyond the amyloid beta hypothesis for drug development? I'm just wondering, could the person who sent in that, could they just give a little bit more clarity on the particular information that they're looking for? Yeah, okay, so um, maybe, was, yeah. maybe a little bit more. Um, and there is another question about a drug, but again, and I don't know, I think this is um, possibly more for arthritis. Is there any successor candidate to Enbrel? I don't know if you're familiar with Enbrel. I am, um, yeah, no, that's from another, an, another company. So, um, so there, I can't comment on, on, on that because it, it's another company that actually uh, manufactures and produces, distributes that particular medicine. Um, so I think the, the, I think what I can say in general about um, research and pipeline um, is that uh, I think companies overall are more and more ambitious in terms of what can be achieved. And um, each time a molecule is developed, and that there is a positive response that leads then to, you know, multiple follow-up um, projects to improve, to develop. You know, one success leads to um, investment for to 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 look for the next molecule within a therapy area. And I think we've we've all seen great breakthroughs and um, molecules and, and, and medicines for, for for therapy areas that we couldn't have imagined uh, a number of years ago. So companies are being braver, they are taking risks, they are really pushing the, the boundaries um, and really, um, I think, exploring science in a way that we couldn't have imagined 15, 20 years ago. So, so that's the first thing. I think it's always challenging and it's always difficult when you, when, and, and obviously the audience here has a great interest in, 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 in or indeed, uh, in the absence of, um, um, of something having a license and depending on the environment, it's very difficult when you work with a company to actually discuss anything that's that's in development. There are certain platforms where that can happen, but unfortunately, this just isn't the kind of environment where we can expand on um, what's happening outside of, of, of the medicines that have been licensed. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question here. Uh, did you do a master's degree? Um, so I know you mentioned the, the BSc and the PhD. Did you also do a master's? Well, I, I didn't actually, because at the time, so I think it's probably changed now, but at the time um, you were able to go straight, depending on your, um, your finals, uh, you could go straight to a PhD. So, so, so year one after your bachelor, you registered as a PhD student um, automatically, depending on your you know, grade and, and uh, et cetera. So um, I, I think now a lot of people start to do an MSc first and then progress. But 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 back then in the old days, um, you didn't uh, you, you you didn't have to. Um, and it, it wasn't it wasn't the norm to be honest. The the norm was to to start and straight away get get stuck in to to the PhD project. Yeah, yeah. I think as you say, I think it has changed in recent years where universities prefer if people start on the master's track. That seems to be more the norm. Yeah. And I think part of that is because there were a couple of examples where people started um, PhDs and decided, you know, research wasn't for them. And sometimes it's very hard to turn a PhD into a shorter project. Yeah. Um, and equally, it can be challenging as well. Some, you know, not every master's will have the, 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 the scope to become a PhD. And, and so then it, I, think, I, think, I think the thought process is totally different. So anyone who did an, uh, an MSc initially tended to start a new project then for their PhD as opposed to stretching or changing yeah. um, the masters. I think the thought process is very different now though and the funding mechanism and all of that has changed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a question here, do you foresee a time when more biotech discovery research will be conducted in Ireland rather than manufacturing and development? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's changed hugely. Um, so I, I, I hope I wasn't unclear on that. I think it has changed significantly over the past decade. There's certainly much more R&D in Ireland. But, but at the time when I wanted to or was looking to move, you know, I didn't want to go into manufacturing. I was very clear about that. It wasn't for me. There was very little R&D. I think there's great examples now of partnerships between industry and academic institutions. 
um, in, in there are multiple examples globally, but there, there are examples here in Ireland as well where um, we, there's collaboration, strong collaboration between uh, the work that's been doing been done in the universities and companies um, where companies get involved at, at different stages. It, it, it's totally changed. I mean, you know, each side of the table recognizes the value and the expertise um, that the other stakeholders have. So I think um, I think it's changed. I think it will continue to change. I, I think neither group can really succeed to what they want to really achieve without the other. So I, I, I think we're, we're totally interlinked, to, to be frank. Okay, good. Um, another question, what would you recommend for a PhD in biomedical sciences thinking to start a career in medical affairs? Are there particular topics, courses that would be good to prepare in advance or particular strategies? Oh gosh, Somebody, <laughs> somebody's been doing their homework. In it. <laughs> yeah. So I think the first thing is that, I mean, this is my opinion now, I want to be very honest, this is just my experience. I think, Pete, you have to love um, and enjoy your PhD topic. You know, it's, you know, looking back, I, I remember all the good stuff. Um, I'm not, my memory isn't so much that I haven't forgotten all the, the late nights, the cycling back to the lab late in the evening, you know, on a wet night because something happened or something went wrong or disappointment when you don't get the result that you expected and you're tearing your hair out, the clock is ticking. So it's, it, it all of that helps in terms of resilience. It really helps later on when, 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 when because all those disappointments can happen in any environment. Um, but the successes are, are so rewarding. So the first thing I would say is that um, working with people that you like. I'm a, I'm a people person personally. I think it's really important that you like the group, you like the, the team, the prof. Um, that there's that, that that you feel that you, you know you, you could learn. It's really really important to be in an environment that for you as an individual you feel would be good for learning and developing and you have to like the topic because the techniques of the technology um, in many cases will be applicable across lots of different um, labs but you have to get up every day and go in and actually do it so it's, I think that's the first thing so for me it's about the people uh, and, and, and really enjoying the topic um, and then being clever about the skill set I mean I think with you know, two of my, my, my roles in industry were, were new roles and that there was no predecessor. So I went into, you know, an empty desk, an empty office, an empty filing cabinet. You know, it, it, was, it was brand new. And I think with anything, it's what you make of it. And the same with, with, with your PhD. You know, you can raise your hand up for to be involved in collaborations, to present at things, to do extra teaching, to do whatever. You know, with anything, if you, if you, if you enjoy it and you're interested, you will pop your hand up and you will put yourself forward for you know appropriate things when it comes to moving into the industry for sure if you have a PhD in neurology and you're applying for a role with a neurology company of course it's going to be um, an advantage of course it is but it doesn't mean that 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 somebody with a PhD in something totally different won't pip you to the post for or something you can't even predict so um, I suppose what I would say is to enjoy and to get the most from the educational opportunities because it's a real privilege to, to have the time and to, to, to work with really good people um, is, is, is to really do your homework about who you'd work with, what the group is like um, um, and knowing that you would enjoy the therapy area. So I, I hope that, I hope that that answers, you know, I, I don't think it, it's incredible because when when you get that first opportunity um, within industry, then you'll 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 realise how strong your skills are and how much you can bring, how much you bring to the table and and, and to the team. Yeah, great. Um, another question: If you want to enter the pharmaceutical environment but you don't have a PhD in biomedical sciences, what are the possibilities or chances? Lots of people don't have, have, have PhDs. Um, I work with lots of people who have degrees in science and maybe a postgrad, a, a master's in business, for business course. And they're working in, um, they could be working in roles in medical affairs, in marketing, in commercial roles, in business roles. So I think, 
I think there are certain roles um, and certain companies require certain qualifications for certain positions. Okay, so for some of the medical affairs roles, not all, but for some of them, some companies might require medics, pharmacists, PhDs. Um, other companies um, may have a different view. Uh, I spoke with someone the other day, she's looking to fill a role. The company wants the individual to be a pharmacist with a PhD. Now, I would think that's, there's not a lot of, I haven't come across a lot of pharmacists with, 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 with PhDs. I've come across pharmacists with other postgraduate qualifications. So it does depend on the company, but there are, you know, a lot of people in, in the industry um, who don't have, who don't have PhDs. So it is absolutely not a requirement for every role, uh, but it is a requirement for some. Okay, great. Um, so lots of questions coming in, which is great. Uh, did you find that completing your PhD allowed you to enter industry at a higher rung of the ladder? Or is there an area of industry that doesn't have a standard hierarchical ladder structure that a PhD allowed you to enter? Um, well, for the role that I, I, my first role within GSK, a PhD was a requirement for that, for the medical advisor role. And I think for, for a lot of that type of medical affairs roles, it is still a requirement, pharmacist or PhD or medic. So that's not every company, but it's kind of a rule of thumb. But there are, there are exceptions. But there, as I said, there are lots of other roles within companies. And I know of a lot of recent graduates um, who've got opportunities with their primary degrees where they had some work experience. You know, some of the courses now have um, particular um, work experience uh, associated with them. Again, that's not something we had when I was um, in, we didn't have those opportunities when I was in UCD. So th there is a real mix. I mean, one, one way of sort of doing some investigation is looking at um, LinkedIn profiles, looking at roles within companies and looking at, you know, people who are actually currently doing those roles and what their qualifications are. Um, but, you know, with the skill set and with um, the variety of roles. So there are roles within the industry now that are new roles that weren't around when, when, when I started out. Market access is a very broad term that's also probably only about a decade old. So um, there are opportunities within regulatory affairs, within pharmacovigilance, within drug safety. Um, and again, the, 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 the expertise of the people in those um, roles varies again, and not all would have PhDs. So I would say not a requirement, but it depends on what the what, what your area that you might be interested in is. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question. I can imagine the efforts you put in uh, going from BSE to PhD. Uh, what really helped develop your research acumen? So the. I, I'm sure it's the same now, but certainly when I was doing my Bachelor of Science, that we had a fourth year, final year research project, which was a big part of that final year. I don't know if it was an enormous percentage, but it was certainly from a time perspective, it was a, a huge chunk of, of, of the year. And I was just really lucky um, where I landed for that project, if I'm honest, in terms of the people in the lab. Um, you know, and if you're fortunate and some people take you under their wing and you you learn from good people. Um, so again, that was probably a little bit of luck, um, timing, and also my own interest in, in, in research, which, you know, as I said, I, I just really, really enjoyed. And then going to start the PhD, um, again, it was being, being in a, you know, being in, being in a, an environment where, you know, I was never on my own. We had a lot of postdocs um, and a lot of PhD students who were um, in the years ahead of me and people were really supportive and we really helped each other. So I, I think that again is being really clever about where you're going to, where you're going to work. What does the environment look like? I mean, I'm lucky in that I'm lucky. I didn't really think about it at the time. I just, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, understand the value oh, well, I mean I did and I didn't I mean I, I knew I was really fortunate I knew I was working with wonderful people um, people with great experience but that you know again gave me a great foundation in the right way to work um, and developing good skills 
So it's really about being smart about where you um, go to, to, to study, I suppose, the, the, you know, the group that you go to work with. Um, yeah, and is there a bit of luck, do you think, uh, attached to that? Or I, I suppose a bit of luck, but maybe a bit of forward planning as well, I guess. Yeah, you know, of course there is. I mean, it's very hard if you just meet people once or twice and you don't know them. Um, you, you, you'll, you'll interpret some things, you know, about an environment because the culture of the lab, it's like the culture anywhere, you know, in the environment. Um, but, you know, in my experience, most people are great. And working in research, people realize, you know, we're all kind of all in it together. Everyone has great days and, 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 and equally you have those really difficult days where um, the results aren't, aren't what you want. So I think there is amazing research and, uh, and the facilities and the, and the departments now. And the, I mean, I think back to, um, there's probably nobody on this call who remembers Merville House. Uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm talking to a, a young audience, but the environment that we were in, you know, the, the, the actual physical buildings and the laboratories, even those of us that thought our, our labs were, 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 were shiny and new and modern in an old building are nothing compared to, you know, the environment and the technology and the equipment and everything um, that is available now. So I think it's about the people, you know, because they, 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 there's great research going on, there's great facilities you know really state of the art you know ireland is leading the way with amazing academics in this country um, and across all of the universities and across the geography so great people great work being done so i think it's about finding a fit for the individual you, you as a person who you might like to work with who you've heard present who you find inspiring um uh, all of those things well for me those that is all part and parcel and, and actually has been very important in in my moves within industry you know moving into gsk was one thing that was the first big um move and i was very fortunate it worked out very well um but my subsequent moves was very much about the people that i would be with um, the culture the environment um, and i'm very strong on that still it's really really important for me personally so yeah okay great um so another question here hi brona thank you for a very interesting talk could you talk a little about how easy or difficult it was to secure your first non-academic post and whether the application interview process was very different? Um, so, it was, well, I remember being very frustrated at the time um, because I didn't know how to do, you know, I didn't, I just, I didn't know how to start the, or where to go. Uh, and I suppose to go back to my point about all the, the, the social networks now and you know with LinkedIn now if, if I was interested in the company now I could find out on LinkedIn who works there I could ping them a message and see would they you know would they send me any information would they um, would they chat to me would they meet me for a coffee you know most people are, are, are very generous in terms of of, 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 um, of supporting other colleagues and peers so but back then I just didn't know so I think it was the not knowing and the other thing is that when you when you get to a point after your PhD, there is a whew, you know for anyone who's writing up at the moment or just finished or nearly finished, it, it, it's a great sense of you know I've I've reached a, another I climbed another mountain. Carol, you'll you'll you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate I'm it. relation to this, yeah. Yeah, but there is a real sense of and it's an enormous achievement. And you know the the writing in that period is very different because you're on your own. So it's really, you have to motivate yourself and, and you really are on your own and you finish and you're at a particular, you've reached kind of an, you know, another pinnacle in your, in your own um, career and, and, and education. And moving into another environment, you're starting again, you know, it's, you're new and, and you're learning. And, you know, that is either something that you, can slot into really quickly and thrive in and then for other people it might be a little bit difficult so it is you have to adapt and you have to be prepared I'm starting again and while I might have all of these qualifications I don't know this environment so I have to be prepared to start and learn and, um, and build up that reputation I think again and a new a reputation in a, in a, in a different environment so to answer the question it, it's there were frustrations at the time. Um, I was fortunate 
that that role came up with GSK and that this the absolute truth, the role, the fact that GSK already had, you know, as I said, maybe seven or eight um, PhD graduates from UCD and Trinity at the time in a mix of roles, not all in medical affairs, but in, in, a, in a mix of roles that they had um, as a company, um, it had the foresight to see that the industry needs a mix of expertise and, and, and mindset. Um, because if we all are the same, like too many of any of us um, isn't right either. So you need that real mix of the, uh, of the you know, the, the, the real commercial business savvy minds, the marketeer, the medic, um, uh, the researcher, all of that. Um, I don't know if I've answered that question in, in, in sorry, Carol, at the end of that question. Um, yeah, and actually, so there was, uh, whether the application and interview process was very different. Sorry, the, yeah. So, so the application process was, oh yeah, the CV. Um, mm. Yeah, this, so, so I think now, nowadays there's so many platforms to help with CV writing and preparing a CV and, and types of CVs. Um, again, back then, it's kind of throwing it all on a page and hoping it landed in, in, in some fashion. I hope I never see my first CV because I, I think it was probably about 10 pages long with, <laughs> with, with abstracts and everything included. Yeah. So I, I think there's a definite style now of, of, of how a CV should be. Um, we're all learning. And again, there's lots of tips on LinkedIn and different websites. And what I would say is, you know, it's always good to get another person to sense check your CV before, before you send it in and, 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 and have a look. I think the interview process, um, again, for the role within GSK, because there was a fit, it was fine. You know, it really was. It was because you think back to if you're in a medical affairs role where you're potentially customer facing, or because you're um, discussing the scientific data, whether it's pre-launch or, or, or post-launch with uh, with uh, with the team of medics. Um, your your communication skills are really important. Your writing skills are really really important. Um, if you're involved in determining um, uh, real world, you know, real world evidence study, again, study design, um, your, 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 your skills from designing your own uh, research experiments, etc. So actually, so much of what you might be doing in that medical affairs role, you've done or you're doing, but just in a different environment, you might be teaching you know, second year students during, you know, their, their labs or, you know, doing tutorials or you might have, um, you, you know, you're, 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 you're writing different things, you're writing your thesis, you're writing a paper, but actually the skills are the same. So I think when companies are looking to, um, to bring academics and PhD graduates and pharmacists and medics into their environment, um, they will appreciate that you have the skills and it's trying to see can you flex the skills and adapt them w w within the environment mm -hmm. so I, I, I think um, I think that the key thing is to match the skill set that you have with the skills that they're looking for within the role that's mm -hmm. what I would say I hope that's that's clear and probably you know practicing as you're saying you know practicing talking about your research be that you know just talking to people outside maybe you're field or you know presenting at conferences presenting posters you know that all helps so much oh it's huge because you still do that in industry you know our medical affairs team would still we still publish we still present at congresses and um, all of that um the 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 the, the need to write up um our publications you know our um local data local data is critical it's really really important i feel very strongly about that i feel very strongly about having um, clinical trials in Ireland, it's a, you know, it is a big challenge for lots of different reasons, not through any one fault, but so, so all of the skills are applicable just in a, in a, in a new, in a new environment. Yeah. And then I think when you're used to talking about your research, when in an interview process, then obviously you're, you're a bit more, you know, practiced at it. So, um, that person just came back and said, thank you. So I think you, you've answered that one. I, think. I hope so. Um, so uh, Barry's online and he said he remembers Merville House. Oh! Uh, <laughs> he did. I was thinking of Barry actually when, when Brona said that. I did my undergrad in pharmacology from 95 to 99. I had lots of labs there. It's now been merged into Nova UCD possibly. Yes, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful building now. Yeah. So that's a trip down memory lane there. That um, is. 
So you're okay for time, Rowan, are you into yeah, yeah. questions? Yeah. Okay, you're very good to uh, requiring the questions that you hear. Um, so what is the average salary when starting off in private industry straight, uh, straight out of a PhD? Oh, that's, um, that's a very difficult one for me to answer, to be honest, because it depends on the company, it depends on the role, it depends on lots of different things. And, um, and sometimes some people are very good at negotiating things. So I, 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 and I, I'm not trying to, to, to avoid the question. I actually couldn't. Um, but what I will say is that there, 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 there tends to be a guide within the industry. Um, so, so what people tend to find is that it, it's fairly consistent. If you're something in one company, you're going to be on a similar, um, similar to somebody in, in, in another company. Yeah. But it's very, very difficult to answer. Yeah, and I think isn't there websites where you can look up average salaries in particular industries? So um, I think you know you could possibly do like a, an internet search. Okay. Um, and I mean, you, a recruiter, you know, again, there they have the the real time data. Yeah. So um, you know, it, it's incredible. The the role of the recruiter is still as important nowadays, even with all of the other platforms. But they will know what's happening in real time and the impact of environmental conditions, the impact of a pandemic, the impact of a recession. You know, all of those things they will know um, firsthand what's what's happening in the industry. Yeah. Um, so another question. Hi, Brona. Thanks for the very insightful presentation. Would you be able to give advice on how a PhD student can maintain a work-life balance? I'm a first year PhD student and I feel pressured uh, bracket by myself to have to work all the time and feel guilty for doing non-work activities. Oh yeah, well I think so 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 first of all, we're our, you know, we're 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 hardest on ourselves, aren't we? All of us. You know, I think that's the first thing. Often we put that pressure um, on our own shoulders. Um, I think it would be a real shame. I think when you're in when you're an undergrad and when there's constant um, flow of exams, it's very you know that that pressure can be quite consistent, depending on the personality. But you know, there's always exams around the corner. I think for a PhD, because it's a long road and it can be three years and it can be four years and it can be longer. You know, back in the old days, there was. For some people, it went on for a long, long time. So it it, it really varies on, on on depending on the on the type of research. So I think the first thing I think this person is very smart to be addressing this now because you can't sustain that kind of pressure ongoing for let's say three and a half, four years. It's just too much for anybody. At least as an undergrad, you have a break with the summer and and and, and you know term time. You don't have that with a PhD. It's 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 kind of, you know, 48 weeks of the year or 50 weeks, isn't it? Uh, or well, certainly when I was there, we didn't have the summers off. Mm. Um, we, we worked during the summer. So I think for, for some types of research, um, it, it's harder than others. You know, there, there's certain types of work whereby you're constantly having to check is something growing? Is it at the right temperature? You know, there was, there was back in the day, there was always people who were nipping in and out of Merville, you know, seven times over the weekend to check that, 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 that things were moving in the right direction. And it was uh, an interruption, but, but, but not a full day's work. And then there's other types of research where you start a set of experiments and you know that for the next 10, 12 days, you need to be on it for, for, for that period of time. Um, now, I'm only... Going back to my own examples of, of, of the type of work that, that I was doing. So I think depending on the type of research and how your how the day works and how the types of experiments work, you have to be comfortable of where the breaks need to come to have a break. And, and I think that that's probably a discussion with a supervisor because there are some people that if the lab isn't busy all the time, they might be of the view that things aren't being done or work isn't being done. They need to physically see people. Other supervisors might be of the view that people are reading in the, the library or reading at home or they're writing or they're doing whatever. So it really depends on the culture. Again, it goes back to the culture and, and what do the senior people, how do they want the environment to be? What's the expectation? And I think as well as an individual saying, well, look, for me, this is how it's going to work. Because do remember, it's a long road. And I think if it becomes difficult year one um, rather than enjoying it it might become something that's like you know 
the elephant on your on your is it the monkey on your back is that the phrase yeah yeah uh, so i would i would try and having the conversation with you know the senior postdoc in the lab the supervisor sort of saying depending on the type of research that you do what's going to work well because some, sometimes you can't always take saturday and sunday off if in the middle of a set of experiments it just mightn't be possible but equally what day do you start them you know starting something on a thursday that's going to take five days maybe that's not sensible maybe you start it on the monday so planning is planning is really really important i mean i, I was anyone who was in in Merville with me at the time you know i was well known for and every so often you know it was literally like uh, the, the spring clean of all spring cleans like every single thing within in 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 in, in, in my in my in my in my in my site and that i could touch was cleaned washed and, and you know the bench was sort of left for, for, for a couple of days to, to rethink. And I think pausing is really, really important because sometimes you think it's so entrenched in trying to solve it, you can't, you don't even know what you're trying to solve. You could, walking away um, and, 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 and spending time to think, it's, it's an academic environment. Sometimes we solve things so simply just by giving ourselves a chance to think. Um, and the one thing we didn't have that you guys all have now is we didn't have all the social media. We didn't have phones. You know, we had, there was a desk phone for the lab that was connected. It was the internal UCD phone. Um, I remember getting the first, e getting our email and thinking, sure, we're all together here. You know, why would we send each, you know, why would we be emailing each other? Never imagining the tsunami that was coming down and the value that it brings. And so many things have improved, but we're bombarded with so much information. So I think allowing time to pause, to think, planning smartly, but really understanding what's expected of you now, because you're not undergraduates anymore, you're PhD students, there's an expectation to, to, to deliver, um, but I think there has to be a, a fairness as well of what's achievable and getting support as well on, on what that looks like about planning and, and, and trying to get some, some kind of a balance. Yeah, that, that's all really good advice. And I'm sure that person isn't alone. You know, it's a, it's a very common issue. And um, I'm sure there's probably supports within the university as well, you know, especially at the moment with the COVID crisis on top of everything else. You know, I think universities are, you know, they were good anyway. And, you know, right, this, you know, there's a lot more online, you know, coffee group chats and yeah. sessions and, you know, whatever works for people, I suppose. Yeah, so, but that's... Um, that's all really good advice. Just, just to say, it's not unique to to your PhD. I think it's it's really important in in in, in all our roles and in, in in environments, in companies, that we're all mindful of that for ourselves because it's we almost are, we're almost trying to do more in the time that we have to get because we can do more because technology has allowed us that we're we're squashing more and more in, and there comes a tipping point and everybody's tipping point is totally different. I think having the the EQ to know that you're, you you need to get the balance that's huge. So many people don't even realise it yeah. that they they need to get the balance. So I think that particular person is you know is is, is very smart and uh, uh, very aware and and that's really really important for for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you start off by saying you know um, I think we put pressure on ourselves and and this person is saying the same. So I think if someone's doing a PhD. You know, they tend to be kind of high achieving people by nature so and, and used to putting pressure on yourself and all that so i think you know to be to be aware of that and, and, and mind it yeah so it's very very different to doing the it's so different to doing the exams in yeah. your bachelor yeah. it's totally different and you find there are some people who excelled for the doing the exams and research then that environment is just really alien to them and equally there are people whereby the exam scenario is not their cup of tea but actually they really really embrace and thrive and develop in in the environment and then some people can do are are, are you know steady and, and and across the board um but i think the thing is to it's to find the rhythm that's that's going to work and that the, the supervisor and that the team in the lab that everyone is is comfortable with you know, I remember there was people who would only work, you know, in the, the evening shift. They'd kind of be coming in at five, six o'clock and they'd work all night because they liked, I don't know whether that's permitted nowadays, but back then, 
some people just prefer the, they prefer the lab to be quieter it worked better for them and you know it's all different what, what works for people and what's permitted within the university yeah absolutely um okay that's great well thank you so much brona the that's the end of the questions i think uh the person who asked about the amyloid beta hypothesis um i'll come back to you separately because i think that probably warrants a bit more yeah. discussion and we can certainly and there's other people in the research network anyway that uh, i know would have um opinions on that so um so thank you so much rona for your time you were very generous with us this morning i know it would have been really nice we were supposed to be in the ashton hotel and okay. it would have been really nice you could have been all shaking hands and saying hello to each other and, and putting yeah. the networking into practice and everything but uh obviously that that uh wasn't going to be an option um so we'll get feedback at the end of the six sessions uh, from people and thanks everybody for uh, all your great questions that really made the session very interesting um, the next session will be on the 9th of june which is neural engineering and rehabilitation for neurodegenerative diseases uh, so uh, we'll finish there and thanks everybody and have a, a good day and a good bank holiday weekend as well which is nearly upon us okay Great. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.